Today we're out here taking a look at the all new 2017 Hyundai Elantra. Now this will actually be the first of a few videos on the Elantra because right now the Elantra is only available with one engine, this two liter version that we're taking a look at right here. However, very shortly this will be joined by a 1.4 liter turbocharged eco model and a 1.6 liter turbocharged sport model. On first glance, this overall look may seem like design revolution for the Elantra. However, on closer inspection, you'll notice that many of these design elements are actually the same as we saw in the last generation Elantra. Everything has been tweaked a little bit and made to look a little bit more grown up in this model. This definitely looks like the Sonata's Mini-Me. We have this large grill right here with these horizontal stripes that are a little bit different than before. More aggressive headlamps. Our model does have the optional HID headlamps and they do steer in the corners. We also have the optional LED daytime running lamps right down here. At 179.9 inches long, the Elantra is almost exactly the same size as the last generation Elantra. Now that's not really a problem in this compact category because this compact category really is practically a mid-size sedan these days. This is actually a little bit shorter than a Honda Civic, but it's about one inch longer than a Ford Focus. The important thing to keep in mind when comparing hatchbacks to sedans in this category is that hatchbacks tend to be a decent amount shorter. They can be between one and one and a half feet shorter than their sedan counterpart. The reason is, in order to give the vehicle this sedan-like profile, they have to make it longer. Otherwise, they would really compromise rear seat room an awful lot. Most of the sedan and hatchback pairings in this segment have about the same kind of cargo room. That's possible because of that stretch right back here in the rear. The scale model Sonata theme continues out back with these attractive tail lamp modules. They continue obviously from the trunk here onto the body itself, and they have light pipes to give you these three little circles on each side. Unlike some of the options in the segment, we do have an amber turn signal, which I think dresses up the rear end look just a little bit more than blinking one of these red lights would. We have Elantra Limited badging on the rear because we do have the top end model this week, and we have a hidden exhaust tip right below this bumper. Initially, we have just one engine under the hood. It is this two liter four cylinder engine producing 147 horsepower and 132 pound feet of torque. Very shortly, this engine will be joined by a 1.4 liter turbocharged engine in the Eco trim that will produce 128 horsepower and 156 pound feet of torque. After that, we do expect to see a 1.6 liter turbocharged engine in the upcoming sport trim that should produce around 201 horsepower, about 195 pound feet of torque. This two liter engine is mated to your choice of a six speed manual transmission in the base SE trim. You can also get an automatic in that trim. That is a little bit unusual in this segment because a lot of people jam a five speed manual, not a six speed manual in their base entries. Fuel economy figures come in at 29 miles per gallon average if you opt for the six speed manual transmission and this two liter engine that goes up to 32 to 33 miles per gallon depending on which trim level you get if you choose the automatic transmission. You'll notice that is a little bit lower than some of the competition likely because of this traditional six speed automatic. The 1.4 liter turbocharged engine should come in right around 35 miles per gallon combined, although official fuel economy numbers have not yet been released. Front seat comfort is above average in the Elantra and excellent in our limited trim, thanks to this available two-way power lumbar support, which you don't find in every entry in this segment. Some of the top end trims in the competition for some reason still leave out an adjustable lumbar support of any kind. Our model also has the optional two position driver seat memory and all Elantras get a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. The sexy side profile that we get in the Elantra does cut down on rear headroom. This is the same sort of thing that we see in a number of mid-sized sedans. It means that if I'm sitting in this back seat with my rear end pushed towards the back of the seat, my head is actually touching the ceiling. Now our model does have the optional sunroof that does cut down on headroom just a little bit. Even though headroom is a little limited, legroom is quite generous. This front seat is all the way back in its tracks and I still have about an inch of legroom left back there. I had a six foot five person in the front seat and I can comfortably sit behind that person. Rear seats get a softly padded center armrest with two cup holders and the rear seat backs do fold down. However, there's no control back here to actually do it. You have to do that from the trunk. At 14.4 cubic feet, the trunk in the Elantra is one of the largest in this category. In sort of a page out of Nissan's playbook, they've also made this trunk fairly deep. And I mean from the top area here, down to the bottom depth of the trunk. That means you can put 24 inch roller bags barely in this position and still close the trunk lid. Now you do have to close it a little bit harder than I would like, definitely a little bit harder than you do in the Nissan, but this does make the trunk a little bit more usable. It also means you can actually put a 26 inch roller bag like this bag behind the 24 inch roller bag in this position 
and still close the trunk lid. That means you can put an awful lot of cargo in the back of the Elantra, definitely more than you can in something like a Toyota Corolla. The cargo area load floor does feel a little bit flimsier than some of the competition. However, if we lift it up, you'll notice kind of a novelty these days. We have an actual spare tire in the Elantra. Not only that, but we have enough room to actually put a full-size spare tire if you wanted to do that after you purchased the vehicle. Thanks to the size and the shape of this trunk, I'm going to give this 9 out of 10 points when it comes to my exclusive trunk comfort index. Now, I would like to see a trunk that's a little bit taller, perhaps, like we see in the Nissan products that would make a 24-inch roller bag fit a little bit more easily back here, but you can do it in this, and you can't do it in every entry in the segment. I would also like to see rear seat backs that fold from the inside of the vehicle and the trunk. I find that option a little bit more convenient, but we do have a handy helper handle to help you close the trunk. On the inside, we have two-way adjustable headrests up front and height adjustable seat belts for both the driver and the front passenger. Our model has the optional leather seats and they are perforated, however, they're not actively ventilated like we do see in certain Hyundai models. The doors are composed of mainly hard plastics, this black upper portion, tan portion, those are all hard plastics. We do have a soft touch insert right here in the middle and then a soft touch insert for this portion of the armrest. The door has an integrated storage cubby with a bottle holder. We have an infinity speaker system in our particular model, so we do have an infinity badge right here large speaker grill right here, and then a smaller one right here in front of the door handle. As we see in other compact vehicles, when the front seats are pushed all the way to the back to accommodate larger passengers or larger drivers, they're actually sitting right here next to the B-pillar. That's not unique to this vehicle. Basically, every compact car out there is like this. That's why they give you this very small little cutout right here, because it's somewhere for your elbow to go. The dashboard styling is definitely borrowed from the larger Sonata. This sort of reminds me a little bit of Volkswagen designs in the past. We have a soft touch injection molded upper dashboard, hard plastics lower on the dashboard. We have a large bin style glove compartment, easily able to accommodate a large tablet computer. Since our model does have the Infinity sound system, we have a speaker grill right here above the 8 inch optional infotainment and navigation system. A 7 inch infotainment and navigation system is available in certain models and the very base version of the Elantra doesn't use a touch screen at all. Both the 7-inch and the 8-inch touchscreens offer Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. You're seeing Apple CarPlay on the screen right now. If you want to know more about this, go ahead and click the banner at the bottom of your screen. It'll be taken on over to a dedicated video on the infotainment system itself. We have two large air vents on either side of that screen, and then we have some physical buttons for the system right down here. Direct access to radio media. We have track up, down, direct access to the vehicle's mapping interface because, of course, in addition to the Apple CarPlay, we have a navigation system in this particular vehicle. If you want to go back to CarPlay, you hit the home button, and you hit CarPlay right there. You can actually view it on the Apple Maps if you so desire. Our model has the optional keyless go and the optional dual zone climate control. Below the climate controls, we have a small storage cubby. It's just about able to store an iPhone 6 inside. You couldn't fit an iPhone 6 Plus or any of those larger phones in there. We have a USB input, auxiliary input, and we have two 12-volt power ports, as well as a little bit of additional storage. Behind that, we have a traditional console shifter. Drive us all the way down, manual mode over to the left, up for up, and down for down. On either side of the shifter, you'll find the buttons for the heated seats. Again, we don't have ventilated seats in this particular model, and we have the drive mode button. Between the front seats, we have a traditional handbrake and two large cup holders, easily capable of accommodating large takeout drinks. The center console is softly padded and opens to reveal a moderately sized storage compartment right there. It's not as deep as I thought it might be. We also have an additional USB charge only port here. The instrument cluster is a four needle design. We have a tachometer on the left with the engine temperature and then a fuel gauge and speedometer on the right. Because our model is the top end trim, we have a color multifunction display right in between those two gauges. The display is controlled via this button and this toggle on the steering wheel. It also clicks down to OK. This display is where you'll find things like your trip computer, your trip odometer. We also have navigation instructions if your vehicle has navigation and a destination is programmed in. If you have navigation and no destination is entered, then you'll just see this compass rose. We also have the status of our various safety systems like the lane keeping assistance system. An infotainment display that will also show you track information depending on the source that you're listening to. We also have a service screen which will show you your next service interval, tire pressure, etc. And you have the availability to change certain vehicle settings right here inside this display. This is where you'll alter things like your service intervals, your convenience settings, lights, door, the way the driving assistance systems work like the lane keeping assistance system, the smart cruise control, automatic autonomous braking, forward collision warning, etc. The steering wheel is a three spoke design with a large spoke right down here at the bottom. Sport grips up top and ours is leather wrapped. That button I showed you earlier is right over here on the right side of the steering wheel. We also have the cruise control buttons and because our model does have the radar adaptive cruise control, we have a distance follow button right over here as well. On the left side of the steering wheel, we have dedicated phone hang up and pick up buttons, volume up, down and a mute. Just click that in the center to mute it. Voice command, mode and then 
a toggle for track up and down. Acceleration is fairly average for this segment. We ran from 0 to 60 in 8 seconds flat. Therefore, I'm going to give this a B minus. This is definitely slower than something like a Honda Civic Turbo, but it is a little bit faster than certain versions of the Mazda 3 or the Ford Focus. However, it does appear that the bulk of the Civic sales will be the considerably faster Civic Turbo. There are a variety of different engines available in the Ford Focus, most of which are faster than the model we're driving right here. And of course, the Mazda 3 offers a larger 2.5 liter engine that is definitely faster than this as well. Now keep in mind that we have not yet driven the 1.4 or 1.6 liter turbocharged versions of the Elantra. That 1.6 liter is again just rumored, but the 1.4 liter is definitely coming. I actually expect the 1.4 liter engine to go from 0 to 60 a little bit faster than this, even though it produces a little bit less horsepower. It actually produces more torque, and the 7-speed dual-clutch transmission is more advantageous than this traditional 6-speed auto, therefore it's likely going to be a little bit faster. That's basically what we're also seeing in the Sonata Eco versus the Sonata's base engine. When it comes to braking, we went from 60 to 0 in 124 feet, therefore I'm going to go ahead and give this an A-. minus. This is among the best in this particular segment, although there are some that are a little bit shorter. Our model is wearing the 225 width tires, and actually most of the Elantras you'll find on the dealer lots have these tires as well. As I've frequently said, handling and ride tend to be two ends of the teeter-totter, and it's obvious that Hyundai tuned this vehicle more towards a comfortable ride. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and give this an A when it comes to ride, and an A- minus when it comes to handling. This doesn't have the same kind of connected feel that we get in the Mazda 3 or in the Honda Civic, although it definitely handles well. There's a little bit more body roll and a little bit less grip, however, than most versions of the Civic or the Mazda 3. The tune of the Elantra suspension is especially noticeable out here on this gravel road. This is definitely more comfortable than some of the sportier tuned entries in this segment. Something like a Ford Focus or a Mazda 3 or even something like a Honda Civic, they're definitely going to have slightly firmer suspensions than this. Hyundai has also tweaked the rear suspension design of the Elantra to make this feel a little bit more sorted on broken pavement or on rough roads like this, especially when in the corners. The last generation Elantra could feel a little bit upset at times in the back, but that's not going on in this Elantra. The biggest difference between this, the Mazda, and the Honda would be in the steering feel. This steering rack is fairly numb. We get a little bit of feedback, but not too much. Of course, every vehicle in this segment has electric power steering, but Honda and Mazda have figured out a way to tune theirs to actually give you some feedback from the front tires. That's not going on in this, just like it's not going on in basically every other entry in this segment. Our cabin noise score came in at 72 decibels, which makes this among the quieter entries in this compact stance segment. Keep in mind, again, we are testing the top end limited trim, base trim is likely going to be a little bit noisier out there. In the past, Hyundai has had a problem competing when it comes to fuel economy, and although the fuel economy has improved in the Elantra and there is that new Eco trim, it is still an area that Hyundai lags behind the competition. The EPA average for this particular model is 32 miles per gallon combined. We have actually been beating that at 33 miles per gallon combined over about 560 miles of very mixed driving. There's a trade-off between fuel economy and transmission feel. This transmission is going to feel just like a regular old six-speed automatic transmission. It's going to shift gears just like you expect. The downside, of course, is the zero to 60 time and the fuel economy. CVTs make the most of a small engine, both in terms of economy and acceleration, and of course, six-speed automatics are going to be a little bit behind that. Of course, the fuel economy answer from Hyundai is the 1.4 liter turbocharged engine that we do expect to see very soon. That should average about 35 miles per gallon in combined driving according to Hyundai, and that should put this right in competition with the rest of the compact sedans. However, it's only going to be in that one eco trim. At this point, we haven't seen Hyundai say whether or not they're going to stick that engine in the limited trim. As we see in a lot of vehicles in this segment, the Elantra starts quite basic in its base SE trim. At $17,150, you don't get Bluetooth, you don't get steering wheel audio controls, and you don't get a touchscreen audio system like you do find in some vehicles in this segment. However, the base price is quite low in the SE trim. It undercuts the Honda Civic by $1,500 and undercuts the Toyota Corolla by $200. Ford's Focus manages to be about $1,000 less expensive than this Elantra, but it uses a five-speed manual, not a six-speed manual, and of course you get fewer options and features on the inside in that base model as well. At the moment, there are just two trims of the Elantra available in the US, the SE trim and the limited trim that we've been taking a look at here. These will very soon be joined by an Eco trim again with that 1.4 liter turbocharged engine and likely a Sport trim with the 1.6 liter turbocharged engine. When comparing the Elantra to other options in this segment, the warranty coverage is an important thing to keep in mind because this has a five-year, 60,000-mile bumper-to-bumper warranty and a 10-year, 
100,000 mile powertrain warranty. That's notably longer than you find in any other entry in this segment. It's also longer than you find in many luxury vehicles on sale in the United States. Adding an extended warranty to your Corolla, your Civic, or your Focus would cost you about $1,000. That means that when we take a look at the Honda Civic, it's going to actually be about $2,500 more expensive than this. The Corolla is about $1,200 more expensive than this, and it actually makes the Ford Focus right about the same base price, even though it has less standard equipment. In fact, when you factor in that standard long warranty on the Elantra, this becomes one of the least expensive vehicles in this segment. Moving up from the base SE model, you can add the automatic transmission that we've been driving this week for $1,000. The $800 popular option package is definitely one that I would select. It includes a 7-inch version of the touchscreen that we've been seeing in this vehicle without navigation, but it does have CarPlay and Android Auto. It also has auto headlamps, Bluetooth, alloy wheels, cruise control, and a backup camera. For an extra $1,300, you can also add the tech package, which gives you heated seats, the blind spot warning system, auto climate control, the auto driver side window right here, up and down, daytime running lamps, and keyless go. If you load your SE trim all the way up, it will be about $1,400 less out the door than a Honda Civic. And of course, we do have that long warranty to consider, which makes it about $2,500 different or so. The limited trim that we've been driving starts at $23,350 and basically gives you that 7-inch LCD standard, leather, and a number of other options that are optional on the SE trim. It also unlocks a few option packages that gives you the bottle that we've been taking a look at right here with the 8-inch navigation system, the sunroof, the heated rear seats, the Infinity audio system, HID turning headlamps, radar adaptive cruise control, and lane keeping assistance. All that will set you back $27,585. The SC trim is definitely one of the most value-packed entries in this segment when you factor in the long warranty. The limited trim is kind of an interesting twist in this segment because we don't get any more power under the hood. And in a lot of the competition, when you go out to the top end trims, you do get more power. Fuel economy is something that Hyundai has struggled with in the past, and that really hasn't changed too much for the 2017 model. The Eco trim should be more competitive with the average version of the Honda Civic. However, this model will get you about two to three miles per gallon lower than we see in a lot of the Eco competition. In addition, a number of the competition have really upped their interior game, and especially in their top end trims, they swap out more of the hard plastic touches that we see in this cabin for soft touch plastics. That really affected me on the driver's side right here because the hard plastic right on the top of the door sill meant that I couldn't put my elbow there comfortably like you can in some of the vehicles in the segment. Obviously, the 800-pound gorilla in this segment is the Honda Civic. It's been completely redesigned for 2016. Honda has decided to do a few unusual things with the Civic this time around. They have a hatchback coming to the U.S. finally. They have a turbocharged engine under the hood in mainline trims, not just the Civic Si, which we should be seeing very soon. And they've also decided to make their Honda Sensing package, which includes radar adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assistance, even on their low-end trims. That's very different than we see in every other entry in the segment, and it's very different than we see in this Elantra, because if you want radar adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assistance, you can get it in this limited trim, but you can't get it in the low-end trims. That means that if you're shopping for a compact vehicle and you don't want things like HID headlamps, an up-level sound system, navigation in the dashboard, etc., but you do want radar adaptive cruise control, the Civic really is your only option. When it comes to comfort, the Civic and the Elantra tie in my mind. The Civic's infotainment system is a little bit closer to the driver, making it easier to actually work with, especially if you're using Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. The door sills in the Civic are soft touch plastic, which makes it a little bit more comfortable to put your elbow on. However, this driver's seat is more comfortable than we see in the Honda Civic. I think the steering wheel is a little bit more comfortable as well. Without question, the Civic is faster thanks to its available turbocharged engine and its continuously variable transmission. This may give you a more traditional feel with the six-speed automatic transmission. However, it's not going to be quite as fuel efficient and it's not going to be quite as fast as the Honda Civic. When it comes to looks, I think the Elantra wins hands down. The current look of the Honda Civic is not quite my cup of tea. That large chrome bar across the front just isn't as attractive as this mini Sonata look. When it comes to driving dynamics, the Civic wins again. This is a little bit more comfortable out on the road, but the Civic is a little bit sportier. Nissan's Sentra is a very inexpensive option in this segment at $16,780. However, it ends up right around the same price when you factor in the long warranty again that we see in the Hyundai Elantra. The Sentra does have a more usable back seat, however. We get more room back here for rear passengers, both in terms of headroom and legroom. 
In terms of design, I find the Hyundai to be more attractive than the Nissan inside and out. The interior, especially in this vehicle, feels more modern. It feels more upscale than we see in the Sentra. The Sentra uses Nissan's low-cost infotainment and navigation system. This uses basically the same system that we see in the upper-level trims. The graphics and everything about the system just feels a little bit more upscale. Basically, the same thing goes for the Toyota Corolla. I find this more attractive inside and out, more premium feeling inside and out than the Toyota. However, if carrying tall people in the back is important to you, you will find more room in the back in the Sentra and the Corolla than you will find in the Elantra. The Corolla's price tag is fairly low for this segment, but we also get one of the least powerful engines and one of the least enjoyable CVTs in this particular segment. This is definitely an awful lot more fun to drive than we see in the Corolla. On the flip side, of course, the Corolla will get better fuel economy. Despite recently getting an interior freshening and a nose job, the Ford Focus is still one of the older entries in the segment, and it definitely shows. I actually think this is more attractive than the current generation Ford Focus. The merging of the larger sedan's looks on this vehicle, both in the rear end and in the front end, and sort of the side profile, just seems to work a little bit better than what we see in the Ford Focus. Ford basically took the design language from their larger Fusion, and they jammed it onto the Ford Focus, but it doesn't fit quite as well as this design language on the Elantra. On the flip side, Ford offers more variety than we find over here in the Elantra, both in terms of options, engines, etc. Depending on your world market, there are, of course, all-wheel drive performance versions of the Ford Focus. There is a three-cylinder version of the Ford Focus for fuel economy. Ford offers standalone options, which you don't see in vehicles like this, where you would just have option bundles. So over there on the Ford side, you can just pick and choose options that you want and customize your vehicle in many more ways than we can see right here in this vehicle. However, the Ford Focus is likely going to set you back more than this. It's also probably going to be a little bit more expensive to maintain in the long run. Volkswagen's Jetta used to be one of the best handling and best feeling vehicles in this segment. However, they've actually turned the dial back just a little bit on the current generation Jetta. Instead, they've been favoring interior room, and the Jetta does have an absolutely enormous back seat. When it comes to repair and maintenance costs, the Jetta is likely going to be more expensive than this Hyundai to keep around. Then we have the Mazda 3. The Mazda 3 doesn't sell in terribly high numbers in this segment, but it is one of the most fun options out there. This is not quite as dynamic out on the road, but this ends up being a more practical vehicle. The Mazda 3 has also been around for a little while in this particular segment, and I actually think that parked next to each other, I prefer the design language on this Elantra to the current generation Mazda 3. The Elantra is a solid practical entry in this segment. It's also one of the most attractive in my opinion. However, when it came time to tally my numbers, I actually rank the Honda Civic just a little bit higher than the Elantra. The fuel economy in the Civic is better, the acceleration is better, the handling feel out on the road is slightly better as well. I found the ergonomics in the Civic's interior to be a little bit more to my taste than in this Elantra's, even though I prefer the Elantra's style to the Civic's style. The position of the infotainment system, the soft touch armrest, the soft touch upper door trims so you can put your elbow there, etc. We also have the auto brake hold option in the Civic, which is something that you don't see in many other vehicles in this segment. It means that city traffic is a little less tiring because you don't have to keep your foot on the brake pedal. The Civic is full of little touches like that that just push it over the edge for me versus the Elantra. I think the Elantra is the more attractive entry in this segment inside and out. It's also a little bit more unique because there are a lot of Civics out on the road. One big win in the Elantra in the limited trim is the driver's seat because it does have a two-way power lumbar support and two-position seat memory that does make it more comfortable and more adjustable than we see in most entries in this particular segment. However, if my money were on the line, I suspect I might just get the Civic instead. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes. Go ahead and check out those related videos down there across the bottom of your screen. Hit that subscribe button down there. You can find me over at alexandautos.com, and I'll see you next week.